Have you ever lost your keys? <laughs> it happens quite often. You just got in from shopping and now you can't find your keys. You check your pockets, you look in your purse and the keys aren't there. So you go back out to the car, check the ignition, the keys aren't there either. You sit and think for a minute. And you think, aha. You retrace your steps back to the house, you check the door lock, they're not there either. You go back inside, you check your purse, your pockets again, you check your coat pockets, knowing that they weren't there. It's gotta be in the trunk. Go outside, check the trunk, the keys aren't there either. You're thinking for a little bit. You get up front, you check the seats, under the seats, between the seats. You still can't find your keys. And after about a half hour of this, you just give up. When you do that, you decide, by God, at this point, you're just going to go back in the house and start unpacking the groceries that you had brought in. You go in, and next to the first bag that you set down on the counter are your keys. And you think, Oh well, deal. But what would happen if it wasn't your keys that were missing, but your child, or a family member, or a loved one? Everything just changed. Life got serious. And that's when you get to meet people like me. In the last 20 years, I've worked on well over 100 search and rescue and missing persons cases. I'm a wilderness tracker, so most of the people I search for <clears throat> are lost in the mountains and wilderness areas of Northern California. As a tracker, I'm trained to be able to study a series of footprints and before long tell you a lot about the person that made them. Trackers are able to look at a footprint and pretty soon could tell you the gender, the weight, the size. We could tell you whether they're carrying a backpack or something in their arms. Before long, we could tell you their state of mind, and after a little bit, we could tell you even right-handed. <clears throat> All these things we could tell in a footprint, but there's much more to the art of finding people that are lost. One of the first things we need to do is we need to define the search area. One of the ways we do this is kind of like a thousand-piece puzzle. Once you get your border in place, you start to put the pieces together that bring the picture into view. We define the search area, then we try to reduce that search area because if we could save time, we could be the matter between life and death. Now, a lot of you people are thinking, well, I don't really go walking in the wilderness, so this doesn't really pertain to me, but how many of you have a GPS in your car? Over the last several years, I've been called a couple of times at least, to go find people that followed your GPS that told them to take a little shortcut through the mountains. They find themselves stuck in the snow or the mud, no cell service. Guess what? You're lost in the woods. <laughs> a lot of times, people will think that it's easy for people to be found, but it isn't. It's incredibly hard. One of the ways we try to find people is by asking their family and their friends who they really are. Because if we know who they are, we'll have a little bit easier time understanding where to look. It wasn't long ago, I was searching for a missing hunter. I sat down with his wife and I asked if she could explain who her husband was. She said, <clears throat> he's a mechanic, he's a good father, and he loves to watch NASCAR and football on TV. And I said, that helps, but I really need to know a little bit more about him. I need to know how his mind works. I need to know his instincts and his habits, because right now, he's not thinking of NASCAR. He's thinking about survival. She sat for a little bit, and finally she looked up at me, and she said, you know, I guess I really don't know my husband that well after all. And this is becoming more and more common. As a society, we've insulated ourselves and isolated ourselves, not only from the world around us, but from the people around us as well, even our loved ones. <coughs> Whenever I go to search for someone, I'm always thinking not only of them, but their entire family. Each day in the United States, Roughly 2,000 people are reported missing. That's a lot of lost people. 
Sometimes when I'm wanting to find out who a person is, it's so frustrating when even a family member can't even describe who they are. And I think who we are has a lot to do with our culture that we grew up in, our heritage, our genetics, and all the things that made us who, our life experiences that make us who we are. I'll use my life as an example of what I'm trying to talk about. My ancestors came west 250 years before the gold rush. They came to the west coast, they married the local native women, and their children became my grandparents. I've had the unique experience of being able to ride the same trails they rode. I've slept under the same stars, and I watched the sun rise over the same beautiful mountains they called home. Some of the kids I grew up with had a real similar heritage. Some of us lived just a few miles from where we were born. Our roots ran real deep. We were raised in a land of big timber, farms, ranches, and just good old hard-working folks. We learned to have good manners. We respected our elders. We learned to eat everything on our plate and not to cry over spilled milk. My childhood didn't come with training wheels. When you found yourself bucked off your horse or your bicycle, you were told to just get back on and do the best you could. So you pick the gravel out of your elbows, and you brush yourself off, you get back on. You knew how to ride. I once told my folks I was afraid of the dark, and I wanted to leave my light on. A little while later, I found myself on the back porch. I had my blankets and pillows in my hands, and I heard the door lock as the porch light went out. I wandered off into the orchard and tried to blend in with an apple tree, thinking that the monsters wouldn't be able to see me so well. And as you can imagine, something absolutely amazing happened. It was between midnight and daylight. I fell asleep. <clears throat> Next morning at the breakfast, my fear of the dark wasn't mentioned. And actually, I learned how to deal with a lot of my fears in a similar fashion. And I had a few. I guess at this point, you don't even want to know how I learned how to swim. <laughs> but as a kid, I had one of the greatest gifts a child could ever have. I had an Indian grandmother. She lived next to a creek in an old board cabin about an hour out of town. She barely stood five feet tall and she was kind of stooped over. She didn't have shoestrings in her tennis shoes and she wore an old cotton dress. When she smiled, you could see she only had six teeth. But the neat thing about it is she smiled a lot. In fact, she's the first person I'd ever seen that laughed so hard the tears would roll down her cheeks. She lived a simple life, a few chickens, a little garden. She didn't have electricity or indoor plumbing, and I thought it was an absolute paradise. I got to spend my weekends, my summers with her, and she taught me a lot about the native ways and how to get along. Now, Grandma, she was always the same person, no matter where she was or who she was around. And I liked that because myself, I'd always felt kind of lost and I didn't know where I fit in, especially in the bigger world. One day, Grandma and I were both sitting on her front porch. I was 10 years old. And I'd finally gotten up enough courage to ask her. I said, Grandma, how is it you could still be happy after having such a hard life? She looked at me for a few minutes didn't say anything, so I started to squirm, thinking I must have overstepped my boundaries. Because Indian grandmas don't talk about things like this sometimes. And yet she finally looked up at me and she said, you want to know how to be happy? And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, learn to just be yourself. Learn to just be myself, all right? So for the next 20 years, I worked real hard on that. I learned about love, a little bit about loss. 
And I learned to live a life of integrity, but I stumbled on one part. I stumbled on the part of honesty. You see, it felt like my life was a lie. I was lying to myself. I was lying to everybody around me. When I looked in the mirror, it wasn't me that I saw, but it was a man, a logger, a cowboy. He was 255 pounds, lots of muscles, he wore red suspenders and had a big full beard. I'd always been told to do the best I could with what I had, and I tried my best, but I got to a point where I couldn't do it any longer. I gathered my family together and I told them, ever since I was really little, I'd felt like a girl. And now I was becoming a woman. They didn't take it so well. I don't think they could see the girl in me at the time. But I'd learned to deal with my fears and I'd learned to deal, have courage. And I knew I was making the right decision for myself. Years later, my mother gave me a compliment. She said, when you were going through transition, I was so afraid you were gonna change. And I said, but mom, I did change. I changed a lot. And she said, no, no, you're still the same person. You're just a lot happier and a little bit prettier. <laughs> so you see how easy that is? In just a few minutes, you've learned a lot about who I am. You know how my mind works. And if I were ever to get lost, I think you'd know where to find me. My question to you is this. What are the words that your family and close friends would use to describe you if you ever went missing? Do they even know you that well? Do you even know yourself? In other words, who are you? <laughs>